Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us today's first conversation in the Inclusively series presented by Lewis Insight and Sensafili. Our speakers today are Chris Lewis of Lewis Insight and Monica Paolini of Sensafili. We would like to encourage our audience to participate in today's conversation. Please share your comments and questions using the Q&A button at the bottom of the Zoom screen. All comments are visible to all participants, so please keep the conversation polite and respectful. Our speakers will do their best to address questions as they become relevant to the topics being discussed, so please do not hold your questions until the end. And with that, I will hand it over to Monica. Kendra, thanks so much for the introduction. And uh, this is a, this is really a special conversation we are having, one that we have uh, planned for now quite some time, Chris and I. Um, we, you know, we have been talking about uh, starting to do some work on uh, inclusivity and diversity for quite some time. And now we finally got around to um, have this initial conversation. So today um, we're going to try to um, discuss what is that we have in mind, what are the reasons for us doing it, but also we would really like to hear what you think and hear your suggestions um, for how do you see this uh, uh, moving on and uh, how you possibly want to get involved and things like that. So with that, uh, many of you uh, probably know Chris already, but uh, I think that uh, uh, I would like to ask Chris to uh, introduce himself first, uh, uh, and then we will go through the conversation. Oh, one house item, uh, housekeeping item, um, please do send your questions uh, and, and actually comments as well. They're just as uh, valuable uh, through the, um, the Q&A and everybody can see them so you can have a conversation among yourselves as well um, and don't wait until the end just get going so chris over to you thank you monica and then uh, hello everybody you're right monica this conversation has been going on for some time and and i guess it started from from my point of view around looking at accessibility and how you know as a as a blind analyst obviously i use a lot of technology to do my job as a as an analyst how that how that was evolving, but it's developed into so much more, and and, and certainly my, my day job is still looking at the telecom industry, but more and more I'm looking at this notion of accessibility, and it's led me to to look at inclusive design, which is the the topic of today, and, and one of the reasons that we want to do this and we want to get your feedback and your questions and comments, is that this is it's sort of quite a unique approach for the industry. We've never had this before. Um, certainly, if I go back to the accessibility discussion, it was very much around individual dis disabilities, you know, and it was the it was the way that the uh, thing. <laughs> now, now, you know, I'm doing this. so my left ear has got a, a feed giving me messages from other people. So somebody just thanked me. Thank you, Matt. Love to be with you. Um, so what I was just saying is that the, the inclusive thing, it's a totally different approach because in the past we approached it by individual group that was excluded, whether it was on accounts of disability or, or anything else. And we'll come on to define these a little more as we go through. But what it came evident to me was that it, it's a very fragmented and, and just not, not scalable approach to do that. So as we move into this, this new digital era where everything could be connected and everybody should be connected, then suddenly we need to think, Actually, we need a very different perspective and we, we need that holistic view as to how these things hang together. And it's interesting that when we when we try and put a name around it, you know, we talk about CSR, the, the corporate social responsibility that we used to have. Uh, we talk about ESG. Uh, we talk about EDI. And for those of us in the communications world, EDI used to be an do electronic document interchange. But it's now equality, diversity and inclusion in the in the broader market. And we're trying to put this lens to look at it from the point of view of the telecom and related industry. And, and with that in mind, you know, and, and Monica, a bit of your background relates to this. Do you want to say how perhaps some of your uh, your original research, your PhD work was around this subject? 
No, well, it wasn't really around the subject specifically. My my real PhD research, but I, I did I did some work on what used to be called human factors, and I remember at the time when the the whole concept came about it was like, well, of course, when you design things, you have the users in mind, right? It doesn't. Oftentimes, it really doesn't, uh, and. Uh, uh, I think that there is a question of trying to understand who the users are. And, uh, you know, when, when Chris and I started talking about this, we were actually, we were thinking more in the lines of specific disabilities or specific things that you're trying to address. And then as we start talking, and this is why it took us some time, we understood that there is really a much, as Chris said, it's a, it's a bigger issue. It's, it, and it's actually a bigger opportunity to think about all the dimensions in which we are different. So inclusion and diversity come to be the same thing. And so we're gonna talk about inclusive design, but there's been a lot of work being done over the decades to, to actually bring in and to really think more carefully about who is that you are developing uh, services, applications, uh, or you know, even um, the way you have the, the workplace uh, design. So, so there is a lot of uh, work. And so when, as we were talking to each other, we understood that uh, we wanted to have a sort of more encompassing framework that all the way goes deeper. So it's not just adding on something for say someone who is blind or deaf or wh whatever, but it's a different way to approach the way we design uh, services and, and applications. And, and, and Monica, uh, yeah. What's really interesting here is that what we the way the old approach is very much a bottom up. So we're looking at individual users, we're looking at individual um, parameters. So you know, if I can't see very well, I need a certain access method, and we're saying that's fine. There's so many of those issues, but at the other end, this inclusive design, when when companies are designing products and services, that you know, if you if you try and do that for all those multiple groups on the, on the bottom up approach, you're just never going to address it. But if you start with this inclusive design, and, and there's a couple of really good academics that, that we'll, we'll send links to later on, and one at the Royal College of Art here in, here in London, uh, and one at the University of Toronto. And, and this notion of inclusive design, you say, rather than designing for the, for the middle, which is what we traditionally do, so we traditionally design for a very narrow, somebody described it to me the other day as being, we design for Silicon Valley. Silicon Valley designs for Silicon Valley. You know, so you could so that that profile of person, you know, affluent, got plenty of devices, uh, obviously not not particularly focused on disability. So, but if you if you develop that, then anytime you want to add things on for people who who have a visual problem or a, a cognitive issue or a physical problem, it becomes a clunky add-on. I've been experiencing that for the for the forty years I've been working in, in the industry. But if you if you if you identify and build those peripheral requirements in from from scratch then actually you get the center for free because all of the peripheral requirements by default have a common denominator that address those common requirements in the middle. So we talk, and because we talk in telecoms, we can, we can sl slightly tongue in cheek say, you know, this is another edge. We're designing for the edge and we get the center for free. So whenever people start talking about edge in, in discussions, we, we can throw this in and say, there's another edge to think about, which is the edge of the, the peripheral user case uh, and, and I think that is, is very important to to bring that to the discussion and try and step back. And rather than in the past, we've definitely designed things along the lines of technology as we've introduced new technology. And actually, this is a much more actually it's a much more inclusive design process, isn't it? it it's not it's not leaving people out in the cold. Absolutely. And as you say, we should not be designing based on technology. It's based on the recipients of the technology, the people using it. And, and that's exactly, and our argument, and we're gonna go back later, but I just wanna introduce it, is that we think that that's clearly an ethically good thing to do, but we think that there is more to that in the, in, uh, in the sense that this is a profitable, it's an opportunity to increase profitability and increase the market. And this is really important because ethics is a great thing. It's like good to do good, but if you can also make it profitable, it makes it much more likely that it's going to happen. And so we really, you know, so, so we want to go on to more like be concrete. What is that we can do? And again, it's thinking holistically, thinking about who are the people using it? And, you know, as I said, you know, 
a lot of things are des designed for the Silicon Valley or the laptop class or whatever you're going to take. There is a concept that that's the majority of the people, but it really isn't. And it, it's, a, it is, it's probably not even average because there is so much diversity out there. So to think about that people with disability are a minority is just not accurate because everybody has you know, a different, if it's in a, it is in a different type of position. So we really should think about the whole heterogeneous side. We are not, there is no majority out there. But Monica, to, to, yeah. put, to, put, to put numbers in context, and I know people love numbers. So I, I, did a, I did a few pieces of research, probably dating back 10 years, that Dr. Mike Short initiated when he was at Telefonica. And just even even though there's no consistent source of data around disability, even without that, we, we came to a billion people with different forms of disability. And as you're, as you're quite right, that there are people who gradually the elderly population often isn't in that category. So that's another massive chunk of people on top. And we know there's also the issue of, by, by the way, being temporarily disabled. So, you know, you, you can't get access to your video, so you might use audio and that, and that sort of thing. But then if we look at the statistics around the world in terms of people who can't get access to the internet today. And once again, there's no, there's no really accurate figures, but it's at, least, it's at least 3 billion of the world's population, if not more than that, who don't have access today. So there is a, there is a, a, a lower level, if you like, commercial issue. There's also a group in between who are people who, they have the, probably the commercial means to do so. They're not perhaps trained to do so. They don't have the, the education to do so. And, and no one has ever shown them the benefits of it. And to, to your point about the economic benefit, all of these people ha have an economic role to play. And when I, when I did the original research, and, and you could argue anyway about the economics and the numbers of this, but it's at least a $4 trillion market because you've got a billion people and the, and the way they're spread across the world, obviously there's a, a certain differences in their spending power, but it's a massive market, you know, and they want to be part of it. And, 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 and the, the benefit to... To the industry, you know, bringing in the next billion connected company people into the into the mobile world is, is obviously a massive issue. Um, but and and then getting everyone to then use whatever services they can in that. I mean, I'm, I dare say we'll, we'll come onto the metaverse later on. I'm sure as a, perhaps as a closing topic. But you know, in that ultimate you know digital environment where where we, everything's being done digitally, then we want everyone to benefit from that. But and I think the other overlay, which is really important to mention at this point is that the business model that we've traditionally used in the telecom industry is, you know, we sell, a, we sell a device and a service to a person, we sell a device and product to businesses. Well, we're now much part of this much broader digital environment and therefore allowing, allowing all those people who may well have been previously excluded, uh, as well as the, the so-called mainstream market, allowing all of those people to get access to all the services and generate wealth and so on is, is a massive incentive for everybody. So designing it so everybody can consume it in the way they want to consume it is really important. So yeah, you're right that that stepping back and that and that holistic view is, is is just incredibly important for the industry. Now there is a comment that it's a, um, from the audience. A question is how do we get past the social stigma associated with inclusive design, which might appear to be targeted towards the niche markets from the big telcos who are chasing cool young people need to show it can appeal to the mass market and how it can make money. And I think that this is exactly what we are talking about. And uh, and I think that the reason why there is, uh, you, you say stigma um, is, is associated, it's because a lot of time when you see the sort of accessibility features, first of all, they are, they are hidden and they are on top. They're put on top in a way that it's annoying for, I think for everybody, it's not working well, it's clunky. It adds complexity. So if it's built in into the process of designing the service and applications, it will not be seen as a sort of, a, a, as a heavy addition, as an imposition, if you think, if you want, you know, it's not something that detracts the experience of everybody. It's just that more people can use it. Now, on the profitability side, I think that not only we need to think about the people using it and potentially paying for, for it, you know, they might, but also for a lot of uh, organizations. So for instance, you know, healthcare, social services. So there is all sorts of other uh, uh, entities that stand to financially benefit from it 
and they are going to be willing to pay for it. Definitely. And, and, and that's the business model issue that I was raising there, which is that pe pe people will pay, will pay through different sources. So it may well, your social services example is a, is a great one because it may well be paid for through either through insurance, if that exists within a country or, or, or through a third party. But it's that new, uh, the new, we call it B2B to B to X, don't we? But there's, there's also a, a, a spin on that called B4B, which is where businesses do things for other businesses, which is more of an ecosystem play. And I can see much, I can see much more of that. People becoming more aware of it. It gets paid for in different ways. You know, the whole, the whole internet model, let's face it, and the big discussion in our industry about, you know, should the over-the-top guys pay for more of the connectivity? Well, actually, the end users are paying for that as well. You know, the, the, the business model has, has changed significantly already. It will continue to do so, whether it's paid for by advertising, by private insurance or whatever. But it, it just changes the point of contact. But I, I think there's an, another really important point to raise here, Monica, which is that the design of systems, and, and, and the, this comes back to the question of what do we need to, what, what sits under inclusive design? And, and I, I made lists, and every time I went back to my list as we were preparing for this, I changed the list. You know, they, I kept adding things, and that's why we'd love people to give feedback if we're missing anything in here. But, you know, from the point of view of the way that systems are designed within companies, the way the interface is designed on devices, whether it's laptop or, or mobile, uh, the way in which the software is designed, you know, the openness of APIs, the way we might be able to pass information between, between different services and so on, all of these things actually mean that if we build a more inclusive set of services from the bottom up within companies, let, you know, so within telco, since we're talking about the telecom industry, if we build it from the bottom up in there, actually those organizations become inclusive by definition. And that also becomes an employment opportunity for people with, with disabilities or whatever uh, within those organizations. So that plays into the diversity, diversity angle within, within employment. Because we're going more software centric and more, and more digitally driven, then all of the channels of communication that we use to reach out to all of the different user groups and, and whether they are the, the ones who've previously been at the focus at the center of the, of the, of the market or those, uh, those edge examples that we just touched upon, then all of those, the ability to jump between those different channels means that the customer can select which is the best channel for them. You know, so obviously I'm, I'm not a big fan of letters being written to me. I'm not a big fan of people pointing me at, at, at websites. But, but I am a big fan of actually speaking to a, to a, to a customer agent uh, who is knowledgeable and can talk to me about the, about the products and services. And by the way, so are, the, so are a large proportion, of, certainly in the elderly end of the market. So I think when the, in, in the previous question about, about Gen Z and the, and the youth, yes, we do see a lot of emphasis on that because they're the next generation of people buying the services. But actually, if, if telcos especially look at the, the, the map of who's paying most money to them today, you know, there's, there's a hell of a big market out there who are perhaps not very satisfied and who would benefit from a more inclusively designed set of services uh, and, and, and set of technology behind it. Yeah, and uh, older people tend to have a lot more money. So um, it's not, you know, or we, I should say, we're, we're not as cool, but, you know, there, and there is a question of, you know, um, how you know to really think about things that are not necessarily as sexy as you know um i'm sure that you know chris we've seen it you know we, we have to go as analysts through so many demos and when you think about you know things like the metaverse or you know the new you just want to think about people going on holidays people doing you know all sorts of entertainment type of uh, services but when you think and you, when you go back and look for instance at covid uh, the, the wireless industry has been really instrumental in being helpful to so many people and i think that we can just move that further because this is really something that again not only is good and useful but it really addresses a need that is out there it does and and i think what's I mean, I say there are so many angles to this and, and you know, please bear with us, we're, we're jumping around a bit, but we, we will write this up and, and come to a, some sort of conclusion around this. But, you know, one thing I'm very conscious of is that there's, there's two elements that are really important here. One, one is content creation and one is content consumption. And, you know, one, uh, there was a, a message I got prior to the event here from, from a guy who's a specialist in, in the standards that are used to, to get web pages so they're absolutely accessible, so they can deliver the content, they've got all the right triggers. Now, I know these standards exist, and I'm, I've even seen uh, a multiverse industry group talking about standards for inclusion as well, which is great. But the execution of that, the way in which content gets created and tagged, and therefore available to, 
all of this this diverse community is still so so way off the mark you know so so that's the all the stuff that you that somebody with with good sight and good technical skills can get access to you know we, we've not done a great job the design of that needs to change significantly and then content creation in terms of and i don't mean just doing tiktok videos but in terms of con, you know collaboration working with colleagues you know i i like like most people on this call have spent the last two and a half years doing everything via zoom calls and teams and webex and so on and i can tell you there is no consistency in the way that i as a blind person can get access to the the mechanics of this of this uh, of this the zoom or webex or, or whatever there should be some sort of at least consistency at least consistent short hotkeys to be able, to be able to do things so the way in which we build all of this consistency and we think about all the people using the services is so important in fact i was just on a call with a very large telco just before this call and one of the one of the one of the chief execs of the company couldn't unmute himself now i sympathize with that that's because i can't see the buttons but i would have thought that he or she would have been able to unmute that evidence so that education the, the simplicity of interface the design around real customer usage is something which i think we need to do a lot more work on Absolutely. And, you know, if you go back to like the Zoom and uh, <clears throat> this type of applications, you know, we're so used to use them now that it just becomes second nature to us. But for people out there that they're not the laptop class uh, that do not live on Zoom, actually, Zoom is not a, a, at all uh, intuitive. So there is a question. Uh, clearly, if you cannot see the buttons, that's that's a problem in terms of, you know, you, you cannot do the same things. But um so you need an alternative to that, but also you might just be not digitally savvy or you don't have yes. the same experience. So there is all sorts of issues that we really need to think about. And if you think about when you design the next uh, Zoom like application of somebody like you using it, you're you're limiting yourself to a very small group of people. You're limiting it. And also there was a great example um, of my, a friend of mine, his, his mother's 101 years old. She's in a care home. She's got a little screen tablet thing with four buttons on it. And one button says call Julie and one says call Richard. And it's a video link. And just, just so, so simple. You know, it's taking it down to that level that what she wants to do, it's that device specific. So we've we've gone the other way, haven't we, where we're now using laptops and, and mobile devices, which are multifunction. You know, I do I do wonder whether perhaps we'll go, we might things might swing back in the future for design where, you know, some something a screen is more designed for the our interaction with people or uh, or consuming content or whatever. So multiple multiple different screens in the future. But yeah, really. And, you, and we might have both. I mean, you know, a combination because we, we can. Now there is another question from the audience. It's um <clears throat> uh, talks of, um, from uh, Santinger, um, a framework focusing on accessibility and inclusive design has been a predominantly successful approach adopted across many areas <clears throat> of organizations like product brand managing brand brand marketing, customer operations, digital, etc. It does require continually talking about what it is and how everybody can play a part in removing barriers in everything they do day to day for consumers. And I think that this kind of brings us to another thing that we want to talk about, you know, what can we do about it? So yes, it, there has been clearly a lot of progress, but I would say not quite as much. And what we're trying to, Chris and I, were the, the goal of what we're trying to do is really talk about it because I, uh, you know, I don't think anybody has found a solution. This is because this is really a lot of work. And so the question is to really compare notes to an extent to, to understand what is that different people, different companies are doing, what's working, what's not working. How can we do better? So there is really something that is intrinsically a conversation rather than us or anybody else saying this is the way to go. Is how can we go? What are the challenges? How can we move forward? And, and, and I think Monica, we, we've talked about in, inviting other people to join us in, in later episodes of uh, of inclusively. And, and, and I think you're right. There isn't a right and a wrong answer. You know, <laughs> we will gradually work our way through with many different stakeholders. And I think that that's the beauty of this is that it's not just about people doing web design. It's not just about people doing interfaces on on smartphones, on uh, on smart speakers, on laptops, on TVs. You know, it, it's about the way in which we design everything from, and what is what is promising. And I think we, we came across this when we were talking about this with various companies. That you know, the the big players, let's say the the Googles, the Microsofts, you know, 
uh, and, and obviously Apple and the, de the device guys have done a lot to improve in inclusive inclusivity, to include, in uh, to include accessibility for, for more sorts of level. And of course, there's a financial element to that. Well, we've got to bring the cost of the devices down to let that sort of digitally impoverished category get, get access to things as well. But but it is very different. It is very different for, for different organizations. Um, and I think especially where, we're, remember, we're talking about the telecom industry here. So one of those things I always try and do is step back and stand in the shoes of the, of, of the consumer, the user of the service. You know, and once again, so I'll, I'll say if I'm if I'm wanting to communicate with somebody to make a phone call, to send a message, you know, to get onto a website, to join a collaboration system. How easy is it for everybody to do that? You know, it, it obviously, is it, is it financially prohibitive for them to get on board? Then that's that's an issue we need to address if it's the way the interface is designed. And I think. Certainly, if you think about what the way the web evolved, and you know, I'm lucky. I'm lucky enough now that I can't see websites anymore, but I can hear how cluttered they are. And compared to that, the mobile device is much less cluttered. So I prefer to go through my mobile device to get on you know, when, when I'm joining things or, or looking for information. Now, you know, is that because on the website people want more uh, advertising to catch your eye when you when you when you're looking at a particular page or so on? So I think we we do need to think of design from every possible angle. And, and when we bring people in to discuss it in, in subsequent episodes, you know, to see how how is it being being addressed within you know, a company which is much more broadly based in the let's say in the in the web world in the in the IT world, and then to learn how within the telecom industry, we can make the telecoms companies whatever we call them in the future, we can make them more inclusive so they think about the way their customers behave because we telecoms in in many ways there's a bit of a parallel thing going on here, where where, where telcos in the past expected companies to, to 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 deal with the technology and work with the technology they provided you know clunky old telephone you know for x25 frame all, all these old services whereas now we're part of a much broader ecosystem and actually we need to make it much simpler to get involved to, so people can connect so people can do things they want to do live their lives buy the but do their shopping you know as you say go on virtual holidays whatever so it's it, there is no simple answer single answer rather but it's really important that we make sure that every every step of the way from the device, you know, through the through the interface, through the software, through the system, through the connectivity, to get out all the way out and to communicate with other people, that those are all open to be able to, to be used in which, whichever way people prefer to use them, or they may be restricted to use them in certain ways, as, as we've talked about previously. <clears throat> Absolutely. And, and 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 again, and this is what you know the and, and this is where we would like to have your ear, specifically your input, and in what is the best way to, you know, to move forward. Um, you know, um, what at what point, you know, what kind of conversations should we have? And we talked to a, a, a bunch of people uh, as we were preparing for this, and some of you are in the audience and give us a lot of uh, uh, very helpful uh, feedback and in, initially, but we'd like to get more to really understand this is really something that it's it's new in many ways so it's how can we do it because we have a lot of technology that is out there that we can use the technology is actually is not the barrier is not the technology it's how we use the technology to deliver uh, and to improve the, the the value of of connectivity um we have some more questions from the audience so there is one about the fact that connectivity is intrinsically uh, not inclusive because of the physics of it. Unfortunately, that you can't really change. Uh, it, it is true, but you know we, we're also making a lot of progress. It's not just fiber; it's wireless. So you know, uh, I think that you know we're we're, we're trying there. Uh, Do you think satellite will change that, Monica? It could, and 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 I think yeah, it it, it, it could and it should because we we get to a point. So you might not have the same speed everywhere. But that's okay as long as you have enough to get connectivity. What do you think? Oh, well, I I agree. Um, in fact, just thinking about that, that the 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 fact that we the fact we have all these rural development projects going on, uh, and go, often government backed, is indicative of the fact that yes, the the telcos have focused on where they make most return on their investment. So I do think that's true. The, there's another issue which I think is is worth exploring, and 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 I'm I'm sure you, you and, and myself and many of the people listening there's a lot of discussion about the metaverse and and and, and how fantastically immersive <clears throat> it will be but one thing is i was reading something yesterday about the gate the gaming industry 
and how you know the expectation is the expectation that everybody will join in at the same level as in will everybody have a big vr headset you know and apple's latest one was what fifteen hundred dollars so the answer is no but actually the different sorts of communication there might just be an audio only participation within within a within a game there might be a video only there might be a, a watching only op option you know there might be a fully immersive option there might be so i, th I think we get a bit hung up in the in the telecom industry about having the fastest possible uh, the broadest possible bandwidth the lowest possible latency and all these issues but actually in terms of get bringing people in pe people might well be brought in by through other means so we, we i think we've got to be very very conscious of the fact that not everybody will have that that you know that massive screen and that joystick and all those other things but actually that rendering the service across whatever is available to the individual and it might be over a satellite rural link let's say or it might be uh, i don't think it'll be over PSTN for much longer but but you never know so yeah i, I think i think we the we have to be careful that we're not just aiming for that ultimate glorious ultimate solution you know that, that we we need to make sure it's practical pragmatic and actually delivers value to the individual and obviously is, is part of that that broader ecosystem absolutely and uh you know if you think of, for instance like uh, audiobooks and I, okay so this is really like from from a technology point of view it's very low tech i mean it's just somebody reading a book right and yet it's, it's it can be very valuable so there are a lot of things as you say it's, it's not we shouldn't really be thinking you know the 5g 6g type of use cases <laughs> there is way more interesting stuff i would say and especially if you look at you know the healthcare uh you know uh, especially if you see uh, elderly people disabled people that cannot you know uh, they might be forced to their home or whatever uh <clears throat> there, there is so much that we can do and and again the the the, the the savings, uh, not, not only the improvement to their life, but also the cost savings and the societal benefits are uh, huge. And uh, actually, so there is another question about the iPhone that uh, I mentioned as a usability disaster. I think that <clears throat> uh, in, in, a, I'm sorry, in an attempt to differentiate and add value, and I think that that, again, this is where, what, what happens. I actually, I don't, I cannot really comment to that. I don't want to comment to it because I don't even have a, an, uh, an iPhone. But oftentimes, what this, the, the sort of the, the sort of accessibility features get a bad rap is because they're so clunky. They are at honestly, top. Monica. Can, and you, I, you can, Chris. I'm sure you have a bunch of. Well, I can't. I can't see the exact wording of the question, but honestly, I, I pretty much run my business on my iPhone today. You know, I, I think it's accessibility. Apple has been the benchmark. I think mm -hmm. Samsung and Google have made massive leaps in, in developing that. The the laptop screen reader stuff has, has got much better. It it can be clunky, and it, and it is. But you know, frankly, people adapt around it. And once again, it's about education and learning and training. That so honestly, I don't. It's come so far. I, I, and I, obviously, I, I'll happily take the question offline and talk and and talk to the individual about about because I I wouldn't agree. I think it has be it's phenomenally accessible compared to all the days back. If you remember, I remember my Nokia C thirty was it C thirty, uh, which had the first screen and the first, had first Twitter and email on it back mm -hmm. a a long time ago. Brilliant brilliant device with a little T nine keyboard. Uh, the Apple iPhone today is so accessible, but that's for me. That, that's that's for me as a as a, as a, and I'm using purely using the voiceover as a screen reader, but so let, but let's not go down that particular rabbit hole. So. Yeah, and, and I think that you know, generally speaking, as much as we think that we need to do more, we had there, there has been progress. I mean, we shouldn't be saying, oh, that's just terrible. I mean, it is we've made major better. progress, major progress, and and I think the great thing is that as we as we as we move into this next era of more software defined, more software centric telecoms if you want to call it for want of a better phrase you know it will the ability to be able to move to to provide the apis to be able to move from from area to area to use common blocks of code in open source obviously actually it's it plays into the hands of being more inclusive as long as long as we think of it from scratch and so when when we when, when, we, when we're designing new things so i think that that's the really important issue is that you know if we try and do it later on afterwards not it's it will be clunky as you say so I, I do think that's that's a very important thing to in, in we need to build it in now and perhaps there's certain areas we start with, you know whether whether it's people with disability that we, we we try and address initially. But I just my gut feel is that there is 
we need to raise awareness of this throughout all levels within the telecom industry. You know, we want the C levels aware of this. We want all the engineers aware of this. We want obviously designers. And as as we move the emphasis to more application developers within the telecom community, we need those people to be aware of it. Uh, and of course, they they tend to be younger people coming through, but making them aware of it and building it from 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 the get go is really really important. Now, related to this, to some extent, there is another question which is about uh, European standardization. And uh, uh, John uh, thinks that there is uh, a lack of expertise in these areas with engineers that are too many engineers that understand, there is not that many, en uh, sorry, engineers that understand the requirements of inclusion. Um, and how can we overcome that? And I, I think agree. that this is really an, an issue because, and I think that this is where we're, we're we're coming in it's like okay we we understand that that's the goal but how do we get there um and clearly engineers are not trained and that's sort of part of the the, the training schools is it standards i don't know i mean i think that it, it's standards are not going to really solve the problem here i, no, mean, I mean i mean but there are you know as i mentioned before there are standards in w3c WCAG that where in terms of the way websites get labeled but it's more and, and, I'm, and i'm really i'm pleased to say within within the telco community, certainly in some of the work I've been doing over the last four or five years, we see some really bright, bright. So the fact that Telefonica initiated that research I talked about 10 years ago, you know, BT, BT has got people looking at this issue. It's, it's got up to CIO level with it within BT. You know, Orange have got a very good program where they're pushing it, um, you know, to the, 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 the disabled and the silver market, let's say. So I think there are pockets of it. I think getting it into the engineering or software engineering side let's say product marketing side making sure people understand this is a a lucrative market to go after and if we build these hooks in to begin with then then we can develop those services relatively straightforwardly so uh, is it a is it a standard issue yeah, it partly is of course it is but it, but i think the the more open the api environment the more the more software centric we, we build things and and you know there are and sorry and to take it to the extreme on the device front you know, Apple has an SDK, which is around accessibility, and the applications in the App Store have had to go through a certain level of certification on accessibility. Doesn't mean they always deliver everything they should, you know, there's always room for improvement. And the reason we not only do we need to build in from the get go, but it's got to be part of a continuous cycle of refresh of the applications, because my, my pet hate is when, a, is when an app actually gets Re rebuilt by a, by a third party and the new the new company doing it has not put the accessibility hooks in there happened to me on on british airways for example you know a couple of years ago which drove me mad having had a very accessible british airways app suddenly it wasn't accessible because of so that so it's a continue it's not just a thing at the beginning to tick tick box it's all the way through the, the testing needs to be done all the way through Okay, Stan says that uh, he's spoken to stadiums and concert venues and they're not very interested in uh, accessibility and inclusion. And uh, what are the incentives for them to do so? Is it policy? And I would say, well, policy might might play a role, but just not, again, that's not going to cut it. I think that uh, it is exactly the fact that uh, these venues need to reassess their, their uh, priorities and see that the in inclusion is is a, a money making a profit uh, generated opportunity and the, and there's a and there's certainly a lobbying element in there as well in terms of yeah. getting people and uh, a high stand it is it's it's a really interesting issue and in, in fact what is that this is another convergence element isn't it because a lot of the telcos that you and I, Monica, deal with, they're interested in Stadia, right? They want to they want to put extra Wi-Fi, they want 5G to come down. And perhaps it's a push from some of those players which will actually bring the bring the inclusion side down. You know, we, we, we're seeing we're seeing little pockets of it. Uh, you know, what we we have to do is make sure it's in people's minds all the time. So there is one of the reasons for doing this whole series is to is A is to raise awareness and B to learn from each other. And, you know, when we come on to talk to to different players, whether it's a, a more hardware oriented vendor or a telco or academics, you know, there are all these elements that people we will gradually build in the course of this series to make people to give people the ammunition uh, to be able to go out. And yeah, yes, I'm, well, you know, frankly, in the sporting world, we should be lobbying people. We should be making them look at more inclusive. I mean, you know, one of the things 
uh, I'm very conscious, obviously, of how, frankly, you know, disabled sport has become so much bigger, certainly in this in the UK since 2012 with the success of the Paralympics. So, you know, get, get on board with that. Let, let's push it through those channels. But yeah, stay, stay. It's, it's a good question. And it's, it's that issue that it's not mainstream. And what we're saying is if you design, they're, they're designing for what they call their mainstream customers, then whether, whether it's a football stadium or a rugby stadium or cricket or whatever, Actually, if we can add that element in of inclusive design from the beginning and saying, actually, we, they might need a, a certain le- a certain device to give them access. Or in my case, when I go to my my Premier League soccer match on Friday night, you know, I get my little earpiece to listen to to the commentary. It's great. It really enhances the thing. And sometimes they do it for societal benefit. And I think that's that's where this this used to be the CSR issue. So it was a good thing to do for society. What we're saying is it's also good for the mainstream commercial side as well, in terms of pe- people will spend more to get a customized service. And of course, one of the things we discovered during the last couple of years working on this is that if we simplify and improve the design that for with with, with you know inclusion in mind, actually it's often the case that the an individual who who perhaps sits in that middle category in that Silicon Valley category, actually they suddenly find they get better service. It's an easier interface. It's easier access to content. And, and that's what we, we, I genuinely believe that's the case, but we need to start with the inclusive view first and then th- that will come along later. So since we have a question on the metaverse, maybe we can get started <laughs> on that. That, that, <laughs> that had to be, they had to, it can't possibly not do it. So the question is that I think that there is not only a challenge of, providing accessibility for a fully diverse range of people for the, to the metaverse. But there's also then the second challenge about how to provide individualized representation for that wide diverse range inside of the metaverse too, to make it fair and positive as an experience, but also possibly to make it safe for everybody. Um, and I think, yeah, uh, there's clearly more than that, but I think that, you know, when you think about inclusiveness, you think about diversity and the fact that different people have different ways to access, different ways to ex- express themselves and different way to do things. I mean, and so diversity in itself has a value. So for instance, where you see um, women, companies that have more women, they tend to be more profitable. So it's not, again, it's not just for the looks of it, it is, it is actually an advantage. And now back to the metaverse, there was a paper that I just saw today from was for Telefonica, talking exactly about the challenges of the metaverse. And I'm gonna quote it because I said, uh, there is an accessibility and inclusiveness risk if the metaverse is only deployed for the majority, leaving out specific groups such as older people who are less digitally savvy, or people with limited sight or hearing. And I think I, I understand the feelings of, you know, it's interesting that they pointed out, but to think about it, that's the majority is, is people that do not belong to that. There, there is such a thing as a majority. That's just, I think that's just misleading. It just, it's just, you know, it's just not the case. You have uh, other also, Mon- people, that, you know. Of course, uh, Monica, what this also raises is, um, is the issue of identity, isn't it? It's like I, when you go into the met, when you go into the metaverse, do you identify yourself? Do you, you know, do you go in as a as an observer or are you a participant? I mean, I I, I was recently slightly tongue in cheek asking the question, like in the metaverse, can I see? You know, does my digital twin see, and can they feed information back to me? You know, can we use the modeling of the metaverse to actually better understand how people consume content? So there's there's a really interesting, you know, learning process can go on here. But but the, to, to to go back to your question, people will access whatever this metaverse thing is, by the way, because we still don't agree on it. People will access it in whatever way they can. It goes back to my previous point about it might it might be audio only, it might be haptic feedback only, it might be fully immersive. You know, but but the, the way in which we go in, the way we consume content, the way we we live within that that digital world is is down to us and what we want to do. So is it is it purely around entertainment? I don't think so. I think gaming will be a big initial part of that, uh, but identity. But I, and I think and I think security, of course, is is a major issue in there. So we we are so far away from from delivering a lot of those dreams of the metaverse. But frankly, that's why we should now get this inclusive design thought process in place. So whoever's designing, you know, th- those heads uh, those headsets. Need- and by the way, there's also a flip side of this, which is that 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 virtual reality headset or X or headset that is being designed for the metaverse can also be used to channel information or services in a different way 
to people who might not see, might not hear, uh, might not have other uh, or cognitive issues. So we might well be in a position to, to, to simplify and streamline the way we communicate in that more digital environment. Uh, but let's not forget the physical world as well. So. Absolutely. And there is uh, uh, some more on the, on the metaverse from Mark Kelly. So uh, he mentioned uh, a new speech accessibility project for the University of Illinois, along with a group of technology firms, Amazon, Apple, Google, Meta, and Microsoft, uh, that kicked off this month. This project is focusing on using AI to broaden and improve speech recognition technology that so many depend on. Current systems do not recognize many people with impaired speech, and this project intent is to make speech services available to a wide range of people with a diversity of speech patterns associated with disabilities. And yeah. I think that this is exactly what we need, because something like this could just be weaved in into whatever, uh, you know, application that requires speech, which is most of them, right? So yeah. um, it, this is just the kind of like the foundational part that would just make it easier. And again, in this case, for instance, it's clearly if you have a disability, it's particularly helpful to you. But as a non-native speaker, I can tell you that it's helpful even <laughs> if you don't have a disability, but you're just you've not, not exactly good you've, at it. And you've not even touched upon translation there, right? So within the, the way in which the way in which translates so computational linguistics has come on leaps and bounds since I first studied mm -hmm. it 40 odd years ago, you know, and we can do, we do have simultaneous translation systems. So the language barrier that used to be there is it, it's not perfect, but it's, it's coming down. And, and I agree that sort of speech import is, and in fact, you know, if I go back and think about it philosophically, you know, the way we as humans used to communicate, we used to grunt at each other and then eventually we develop language you know, and then we, and we use gestures and then language, and then we put language down into, into words and we use typewriters, then we turn that into computing. And now we're going, now we're going back to using gesturing and all these other, other, other means of communication. So it's, we, we're just, we're developing a full spectrum of the ability to interact on different levels. And that's, that's what we're trying to create. So perhaps that's the, a, a different way of thinking about the metaverse is that's what we're trying to create. You know, we're not, it's not just the, the snow crash, you know, Neil Stevenson type view of the world or second life type view of the world. We're actually trying to emulate, you know, people talking to people, people doing business with people, people consuming content, people, you know, out there enjoying themselves. So I think there are, there are so many, we're, we're, we're getting to a situation where the technology can obviously mimic life because that's what digital twinning, digital twinning can do. Uh, but we, obviously we need to do it safely. We need to be able to do it so the connectivity works properly that the, the investment is there in all the different forms of communication to do so but think about i mean and, and whenever i think about any issue like the metaverse how you how you synchronize how you make sure all these elements run together properly let alone all the data flows around you know and to go back to your question previously monica about the the healthcare and social care the number of, of data sets flowing off somebody of a, a person sitting in a care home, you know, in their 90s uh, with a with a monitor on, a bracelet, whatever on, and feeding information back to the care staff in the home, to members of the family, to the to the doctor, to the nurse, you know, perhaps even back to social services or the it's just phenomenal. So we the reason I say we need to design it very carefully initially is that we want to benefit from all this stuff. We don't want to get locked into particular ways of doing things in the future. And we, we want it to be accessible, whether it means accessing content, information, services, uh, for everybody, you're quite right. Absolutely, and, and you know, when you think about it, I think that this is really the opportunity because when you think about the value of that experience to the 90 year old woman that is just sitting there on, on her own, it's so much more important, so much more valuable than us pretending to go on holiday somewhere else, somewhere, whatever. <laughs> Right. I mean, just uh, sort of like intuitive. Anyway, we have another question on uh, uh, the metaverse. Clearly, it's a popular uh, item from Jeff. Uh, so maybe the metaverse where we can enable those who are excluded today uh, to be more included, maybe it should be better. Uh, uh, this might be the best place to make a good business as well. Thoughts? I think that this is this uh, it is absolutely right. Uh, you know, um, Sure, there is all the sort of entertainment applications which are easier to sort of convey on a, on a PR side of things. But when you think about really, again, the value that, you know, the 90 year old woman, that's really where um, this is really important. And that's where 
there is an opportunity, but we need to think about it so that we do not, we end up putting the sort of the right plumbing to the metaverse <laughs> yeah. to develop that kind of uh, uh, services. Definitely. Yeah. And, and, and it's, and that's why it, in a sense, what we, the, the challenge that we've set here and, and the reason we want to go, go on and, and bring different people in for the next episodes and talk about how they're approaching it is that, you know, th there's all, there's obviously a cultural change within companies. There's a technology change. There's a business model change. All, all these, all these things are changing, but, but we want to explore it. So the people doing the software design for the, the operational systems in the telco can share what they're doing. The people design devices can talk about what they're doing you know wearables you know there's a whole set of industries around wearables and you know glasses in the future that will be perhaps not the the, the clunky headsets that we've talked about but nobody you in a sense we are trying to boil the ocean there's, there's no question about that but but by by raising these issues and showing how they all interconnect and they can all help deliver better service to both to business and society and i, and I think it is that combination isn't it it's better for us as individuals Better, better, better for the the businesses, better for society, uh, because it will all come together, and and I think we can drive a perhaps you know perhaps government and local government, central government will pay for some of this stuff, you know. But on the other hand, a lot of it will be paid for commercially, and the, the business models that emerge, you know, uh, need to make sure that we can bring people in from a, a cost of, do, of of joining this service in the future point of view, a, simp a simplicity of interface so they can, everybody can choose the interface and simplicity of interaction. And if, if all those things run together, then actually it, we, we will, the metaverse will be a fascinating place. I, I don't doubt that for a second. I'm not sure I'll be able to play football again in the metaverse to the, to the same level as, as I did in the past, but you never know. No, absolutely. But yeah, th th there is this, um, um, you know, uh, you can have new, you know, new business models, new ways of, um, you know, but I, I think that also we have to sort of realize that you just widen your addressable market. Yes, that is like kind of very old school principle that still holds, you know, <laughs> you just reach everybody. Well, and, and if you think about it, the, the, what we just what we what we've been discussing through the last hour or so, it, 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 in the assumptions and we're, we always have to be really careful what assumptions we, we make in these situations but the assumption is that you know you've got a high-end device connected to a high-end high-end service uh, you can use the software you've got a big screen to consume it or some wearables to consume it and actually of course in many cases that's not the case but you know people do want to participate in fact consuming media you know obviously i i, I don't look at video anymore but i consume it as audio you know, perhaps there is a market for that sort of audio that I consume with audio description, uh, what, taking a film in that way. So it's it's not for everybody, but, you know, it's like an audio play. If you ever listen to BBC uh, Radio 4 plays, you know, that sort of thing is a is a great way of, of entertainment. I mean, it's just making people aware of all these things and bringing them in and getting businesses aware of it. And from a telecom point of view, making sure that we're building the, the connectivity, whether it's fixed, mobile, satellite or whatever, to, to do that. And in in our homes, out and about, or, or or in business locations, that that's what's really that's what encourages me is that we're gradually ramping up all of this connectivity, and we should be making it simpler for everyone to to connect in. Absolutely, and so there is another question from John, or actually a comment, and it's about uh, um, it's more than standards. It says it's expertise and understanding, and maybe academic curricula also need to reflect these issues better. And I would say, yes, the education is clearly a part of it, but also we need to, you know, reach out and see what's going on in academia as well in terms of research. And that's uh, something that one of, of the sort of uh, uh, stakeholders or the, the yeah, people that we want to exactly. talk about. So, and I guess that this is, we, we need to be open to see, you know, what are people doing in academia, maybe in other verticals. Um, uh, you know, again, we don't want to reinvent the wheel, wheel here. So we need to, no, be, but, but, and it has but, to be probably an, an education, but we cannot just wait for the next generation to be educated. We need to start acting before that. Well, but I would say, Monica, even more importantly, we need to educate that new generation coming through about these issues now. You know, it, frankly, it should it should be part of, I know I would say this, wouldn't I? It should be part of the way people uh, 
are educated at school, certainly computer science and people doing that at university and wherever they learn that, it should be part of that. Access, accessibility and inclusion should be built in from that, from scratch from there. Uh, it, it's And so therefore we do need all these stakeholders. You know, this, to, to go back to one of the previous questions, we probably, the regulatory piece is also important because we don't want to miss anything. You know, do, we, perhaps some things do need mandating. You know, but but fundamentally, as an industry, whenever we think about a service or a product or a service that is being being pushed to to a different customer group, we think how how inclusive is that? How inclusive is that service? How inclusive is that product? And if it's not, you know, is there a temporary fix for it? And longer term, can we build it in into the the, the regular refresh flow of that product and service? Yeah, absolutely. Somebody noted that uh, we have good uh, time, real time subtitling. And actually, I just added it today. And uh, uh, it used to be something that you had to pay for very difficult and it would not work well. And, you know, that, that's the kind of thing that you see is that there is some incremental change. So we are doing better. Massive, massive. And, and, and uh, I don't know if Larry's on the call, but, you know, uh, Larry Goldberg over in the US has done some fantastic work in, in captioning. And, and what I will always say when looking at these issues, we can try as analysts and frame it as broadly as possible, but we I, I can only really stand in the shoes of someone with a vision impairment and think about it. I can think about other people, but to really understand the benefits of captioning for hearing impaired, you know, the benefits of haptic feedback for other people, it's just, you, we, we need to better understand the, 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 the way in which people consume services going forward. And frankly, the metaverse is a, is a fantastic way to even to set up simulation of how that might happen. No, absolutely. And, and, we, and we need to get uh, the engineers developing, you know, the application, the software, whatever, to really try to to go beyond, because even if, you know, the person is uh, deaf or blind, he doesn't understand other types of disabilities. So you, you we need to get everybody involved to really be more aware of it. And I guess, as you say, you know, the metaverse is a good way to sort of... Uh, Try to it's a proxy. It's, yeah, yeah. yeah, it's a great proxy for for everything we'd like to be able to do to to make sure that anyone, anyone and everyone will, will be able to join join their metaverse or different metaverses and actually consume and interact and in, in a way suitable for them. OK, we only have a few minutes left, so we should talk about the next steps uh, we and uh, uh, we, we still haven't figured it out entirely, uh, but we do have some plans. So maybe because you want to say something about that. Yeah, I, I, what I obviously this this was a start point, and the, as you, I hope you've gathered from the way we've talked about this, it's become this, this we've, we've funneled a lot of thinking into the, into this hour to to get people. And what we would love to do is get your feedback. Obviously, we've got the feedback that we've had from from the uh, the interaction on Q and A today. Uh, we'll go through that. Look at that. Please, please do send us any any additional comments. We will go through and we'll produce a transcript of this, um, so people we can, we can share that with people, and then we then we will set up future episodes with different stakeholders, as we said, may, may well be from academia, from people, different companies with different uh, different perspectives on it. You know, perhaps some of the some of the the bigger players, the, the hyperscalers and some of the things like Google and Microsoft and, uh, uh, and and people like that have done done some amazing things. But, but what we're trying to do is make sure that people learn from each other. You know, yes, it's still it's still com competitive commercially, but actually everybody can benefit from this. And if we can get this filtering down throughout organization within the telecom industry. So products are designed initially for that, then I, th I think everybody will benefit. And uh, and I think we'll, you know, personally, we all the way through research, what I love about being an analyst, I'm sure Monica is the same, you know, we're learning or we learn every day, something new changes our perspective on on a particular topic. And, and, and I think that's exactly where, where we're gonna do in the next episodes. Is so, so we're gonna consolidate what, we, what we've picked up today, give that to people, get some more feedback, push it out on, on all sorts of uh, media and then we'll work on the next episode. And if you want to come and join us, join Monica and I, and we'll, I think we'll do it on an individual company basis, Monica, because <coughs> that will give us, you know, chance to explore the way in which a particular company, a telco or a, a uh, networking company or a device company, whatever that they, or, or a particular academic. Uh, and we will do it. So rather than having panels where people don't get enough time to delve into things, I think we'll do it on a company by company basis and gradually build up knowledge and hopefully get everyone on board with this uh, with this inclusively thinking. 
Yeah, I, uh, as an analyst, I often think of myself as being an oyster that you just filter water, so water comes through to you. And uh, uh, and so in this case, particularly, we, we've been, you know, as you talk to people, you really realize that uh, different companies are doing things differently. And that's really important. And that's where, you know, I want to focus on, on getting different companies to share their experience and see what everybody can yeah. else can learn. And they would do different things differently. Okay. There's, and also, Monica, yeah. just to, 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 to tie it back to the very initial, the opening comments, you know, I talked about it going from CSR to ESG to EDI, and actually that's part of this broader sustainability view. So in, in a sense, the sustainability label is the one that hangs over this because it's about creating a longer, a more sustainable industry, bringing more people into it and more, a more inclusive, sustainable society, if you want to think of it like that. So actually... Companies are doing so much more now around that area. CSR is no longer just over in the, you know, in a small part of the company. It's part of mainstream. It's part of the board level thinking. You know, obviously there's an energy element to that. We're not talking about energy here. We're talking about some of these other areas of sustainability, about bringing in and dealing with more people. And I say better for the individuals, better for businesses, and better for society. Absolutely, but I, I guess it's it's the whole set of considering technology as helping humankind rather than us serving technology to have a nice Absolutely. product yeah. and i think that that's really something that is in common whether you're trying to reduce the use of uh, power or uh, definitely everything. Well, and so please please send us your feedback and i think with that should we do we hand back to kendra Yes, because we're done. We need to go on in our lives. Uh, and uh, uh, I would like to thank you all for participating and uh, for sending uh, um, your comments. And we look forward to hearing back from you. Kendra, over to you. Okay, great. Thank you so much, Monica and Chris, for that wonderful conversation. And thank you to our audience for those great comments and questions. A video and transcript of this webinar will be available soon. So keep your eyes open for that. And we look forward to seeing you all at future events.